I've seen a lot of people claiming that Tesla doesn't have any advantage when it comes to batteries. Well, yeah, I think that's wrong. And here is why. The Tesla Model S Plaid has some very, very interesting advantages and differentiations versus other EVs out there. And now we've got a full deep dive on exactly what's going on in these battery packs. And it's very, very interesting. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Electric Viking. Fantastic to have you here on the channel. My name is Sam Evans. I'm coming to you here from Melbourne, Australia. G'day, mates. Yep. Thanks for watching the channel. Thanks for subscribing to the channel. Great to have you here. Great to have so many new viewers. And, you know, this is a new channel. We've only been around for, what, 10, 10 months now. And we're just about to hit 60,000 subscribers. So big shout out to you. Big shout out to our Patreon supporters as well. Thank you for supporting the channel. It makes it possible to do what we do. Even if you just support the channel in a very, very small way, either by watching or supporting us on Patreon, it makes a big difference. I'll put a link in the description below to our Patreon account. There are some interesting advancements in the Tesla Model S battery pack that make it the perfect cylindrical cell pack from a thermal management standpoint. And here is why. Inside EVs and George Bauer report that the Tesla Model S pack has gone through quite an evolution. The original pack was prone to overheating in lightweight track racing, and it could not tolerate the version 2 charging power levels, at least not for long anyway. One look at the details of the original packaging, and it's obvious why this was. It had only one cooling tube per module, so the battery pack just wasn't staying cool enough. And obviously that's one of the reasons why when drag testers or people driving this car fast, doing fast runs, it couldn't do too many fast runs before the battery just couldn't do it anymore or the performance times degraded massively. We've seen the exact opposite happen with the Tesla Model S Plaid. A lot of people were saying, oh, it's a Tesla, it's a, it's it's electric. It, it won't be able to do more than three or four tra you know, drag strip quarter mile times before it, it can't be driven anymore and then it'll be useless. Well, the exact opposite happened. I've seen many videos, Brooks at Drag Times, I've watched a lot of his videos, him testing the Tesla Model S Plaid and showing you that it really is incredible the way that that vehicle can just do run after run after run with very, very little, very minimal performance decreases even after it's had repeated hard runs. So why is this? Well, there were 16 total modules in the original Tesla Model S pack with 7,104 cells. So that means one module had 444 cells all cooled by one single ribbon-shaped cooling tube that snaked its way through the module. That's a lot of cells to cool in one pass from the one tube. No wonder the original packs were overheating. When the P100D came out, Tesla broke the one cooling tube into two tubes. So essentially they added more cooling. The company also slightly increased the cell count in the pack but the number of cells cooled by one tube pass was decreased by a factor of almost two from 258 versus the original 444. That's a pretty big difference. So you can see why that pack was much better performing than Tesla's original pack, but it still really wasn't enough. Now in the Plaid, there's another reduction in cells per tube, roughly by a factor of two, again, to 144 cells per tube. The Plaid has been totally re-engineered, not only to make it simpler, to produce, but also, and most of all, to handle the huge increase in heat rejection. Tesla reduced the number of modules in the pack to five from 16. Remember the double stack of two modules up front in the old Model S? It's now gone. That space is now occupied by electronics. However, if you're wondering, the new pack isn't a structural pack like the Tesla Model Y and the Cybertruck will have. It more closely resembles the Model 3 current design with individual modules that are one solid chunk of cells bonded together with a material that acts as a resin and has fire retarding characteristics. However, we don't know whether Tesla is using the same assembly technique as the Model 3 modules where bandoliers of cells are glued to the tube first and then assembled into the module. Tesla had problems getting the bandolier system to work at first and they had high rejection rates before they were able to solve that. Speaking of Tesla's patents, the two-pass U-Flow cooling tube is mentioned in both the patent app integrated energy storage system, which is number 37, and is called out at 3.30 in the Engineerix YouTube video. I'll put a link in the description below to that video. Tesla Model S Plaid battery torn open. That's how we learned exactly what's going on in the battery through this video. 
The glycol coolant goes into the cooling tube, on the top makes a longitudinal pass, makes a U-turn, and goes back to the bottom of the same cooling tube. So the way the cooling system is controlled is based on the maximum cell temperature, not the average cell temperature. What this can potentially do is prevent individual cells from degrading or dying potentially. If the high to low spread on the cells is seven Fahrenheit with single pass, the new U-flow arrangement evens out the temperature and the max temp is reduced by 3.5 Fahrenheit. This allows more power before hitting the temperature limit during charging and more power on the track. We estimate an approximate 10% increase as per the video. You can really see that in the drag times in the video set, how incredibly fast this vehicle is. It's just insane. And I also made a video showing you the power of this vehicle. Tesla have, I don't know why, but they've underestimated the power. They said it had 1,020 horsepower, but it's got more than that when measured at the wheels and not the crankshaft. So the thing, I mean, if you're actually comparing this to an ICE vehicle, the equivalent power would be more like about 1,350 horsepower in an ICE powered vehicle, which is just insane. Getting back to the battery. With two pass, every cell experiences cooling from both passes. The first cell, both the coldest glycol on half the cell and the hottest glycol on the other half. The last cell before the turnaround gets mid-temperature glycol on both valves. The average cell to glycol delta T factoring in both passes is the same for every cell. Assuming the cell's outer can has sufficient conductivity to even out the cooling within the cell, the net effect is that all the cells get the same cooling effect and are cooled at the same temperature. To keep the same snake flow velocity, you cut the flow in half and double the in to out glycol delta T, same overall heat transfer over the same overall area. The pump has to generate twice the pressure and half the flow rate per snake, so it is sized differently. Now this also affects how the stack chiller is designed, lower flow, higher delta T, which means more serious flow through it from plate to plate and less parallel flow. This is usually done with the stamped internal passage routings. You wouldn't see any change in the chiller exterior shape or size. The chiller is exactly what it says. It chills the glycol coolant that runs through the pack and transfers the cell heat to the refrigerant. Now, one thing that I noticed in Sandy Munro's videos is this vehicle appears to have more chillers than the previous Tesla Model S. So that could be potentially what's also helping the vehicle to cool down the batteries as well. Now, apparently we use this two-pass effect all the time in HVAC systems. Two-pass glycol or refrigerant heating or cooling coils make sure all the air going through a coil is heated or cooled the same way. When we do slab floor heating in houses or offices, we snake half the heating supply evenly around the slab. Then we double back and snake the second half right next to it. This ensures the entire slab is heated evenly and there are no hot or cold spots. For comparison, the Ford Mustang Mach-E module cooling plates have a similar two-pass pattern. The glycol goes up along the one side of the module, touching half of every cell. Then it bends and returns along the other side of the module, cooling the other half of every cell. The Hyundai plate in the Ionic 5 does the same thing, except instead of individual module plates, it does it with a single plate using an elaborate snaking of a single passage out to contact half of every cell, then doubling it back, similar to how we do the slab heating tubing in a house. Now, LG actually attempted to do the same thing with a Chevrolet Bolt EV, but it messed up the T concept and it ran the snake passages the wrong way, getting some cells in each module getting all cold glycol and others all hot glycol. That's one of the issues with their packs. Each module overall got even cooling, but you have to get it at the cell level not at the module level. Tesla claims the primary advantage of this U-flow channel is it keeps every cell within a single brick at the same exact temperature, which ensures that every cell within that brick has the exact same thermally-based internal resistance and voltage. This would be specific to the new Model S modules, as the module's bricks consist of 72 cells, all running in a single line laterally from one side of the pack to the other. With 22 rows of cells, each module has 22 bricks and 11 snakes. By running one U-flow channel for each brick, all 144 cells in those two bricks will be at exactly the same temperature. If Tesla can run, if Tesla ran a single pass snake with, this, with the same lateral routing, the first cell in the brick to get glycol cooled would be a lot cooler than the last cell. And the first and last cells would have different internal voltages, creating thermally induced intraparallel brick voltage gradients, unbalanced current flows, and uneven temperatures, which impacts the supercharging speed 
and also can lead to battery degradation. So the U-Flow concept was essential for making the new module cell brick design work. The Model 3 and the Model Y 2170 modules and the 4680 packs are both designed to run the snakes longitudinally, but each snake passes through 23 to 25 bricks. So the maximum thermal gradient in each brick is only about 4% of the total snake delta T. The intraparallel voltage gradient therefore is apparently negligible and Tesla decided to continue with a simpler one pass snake for the new 4680 cell packs. Even though it does create some cell temperature differences that negatively impact the maximum charging speed. The old Model S with misaligned cooling tubes and parallel cell groups is shown in here, figure 10. You can see the misalignment, it's obvious. So the new Model S pack is the perfect cylindrical cell pack from a thermal management standpoint. Maximum cell to glycol plate contact area per watt with low cell to plate thermal resistance to pass flow ensures even cooling temperatures for every single cell in the pack. This ensures maximum safe charge and discharge rates and minimum intracell voltage gradients. And it's one of the key reasons why the Tesla Model S can perform at such an incredible rate for so long in comparison to previous models and in comparison to other electric cars currently on the market. However, one thing we should point out is that the 4680 tabless design allows electrons from the jelly roll inside the battery to only need to travel at most 80 centimeters versus the 1865 cells that have to travel an entire three meters. This is one of the big advantages of 4680 battery cells. The shorter distance equates to less heat buildup as well as less energy losses due to heat. A lot can be said about how much quicker the battery can be cooled down when needed as well. Additionally, the 4680 cells should have the ability to discharge more power on demand because of this same design. Another advantage to 4680 cells. Efficiency should extend to charging as well, meaning that it was believed that it can charge at longer durations at higher rates before tapering off due to less thermal buildup. Less heat should also mean less inner cell expansion, which would create an increase in longevity or cycles. There's lots of advantages on all fronts for Tesla's new 4680 battery cells. It's not just the fact that they're bigger or the fact that they're using structural packs. The one thing that really intrigues me though is whether or not lithium ion phosphate batteries will be used inside 4680 cells. Obviously we know at some point in time, Tesla will use lithium ion phosphate batteries inside their structural pack. But the question is, in what form? It appears as though it's possible they could be using prismatic cells from an American company, a new battery supplier. But then again, they could also be using LFP cells from Goshon High Tech, who plan on building factories in the US to provide Tesla with lithium ion phosphate batteries. Who knows? It's gonna be very interesting to see what happens. I'll put a link in the description below to videos I've made on those two different battery companies and what's happening with them. Now here's an interesting comment that I found, which is worth you thinking about. And it really raised some interesting points. HVAC man said this, 18650s are a better option for the Model S pack than 4680s for multiple reasons. He says the smaller cell versus the 4680, of course, the 18650s are much smaller cells is shorter and makes for a thinner pack, a little bit like BYD's blade battery. This fits and suits the Model S architecture design much better than a 4680, which is obviously the design of the architecture is not made for the 4680, so that makes sense. He says, we probably will not see 4680s in the Model 3 either for the same exact reason. Model Y, Cybertruck, and the Semi all can handle the thicker pack that the 4680 cell produces by virtue of obviously the battery being bigger. Remac uses 2170 cells and they have amazing cooling even better than this new Model S pack apparently. But that comes from using dual top and bottom cooling plates. So they've got a cooling plate at the top and a cooling plate at the bottom of the pack. They stack their modules vertically to concentrate the weight on closer to the rear wheels and do not use a skateboard type pack. You can see evidence of that in the video on Carwell on their YouTube channel when they test the rematch Nivera and the drag testing of that car, I think they do about 8.7 quarter miles, amazing. Now he says that tabless batteries are required to make the fat 4680 battery cell work thermally and electrically, but there is no advantage to tabless cells for 18650s. Their internal thermal electrical resistance to the outside can, as is, is already very low past the Model S pack cooling problems related to an obsolete cooling snake design. This new perfect cooling snake concept 
combined with the new single row brick design resolves all of those problems, leading in theory to basically a perfect pack for what is currently the Model S and the Model X structure. Personally, I always enjoy reading these articles written by engineers, and I'm sure some of it you might not have understood and some of it you would have, but it definitely gives us an insight into what is going on here with electric batteries. It kind of helps us to understand the challenges that engineers face with them and how they're overcoming the challenges of heating and cooling, because obviously you can't have a battery pack being too cold, you can't have it being too hot. It has to be really within that correct temperature range in order to provide maximum performance and longevity of the battery as well. Hope you learned something. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed bringing it to you. Have a great day and I'll see you again on the next video. Bye-bye.